Hey there, good evening everyone. This is I Care For Your Brain with Dr. Sullivan, that's me. I'm so happy to be with you every Wednesday night at six o'clock Eastern Standard Time to bring you high quality scientific information about brain health, to validate and support the psychological and emotional aspects of having a brain health challenge, to share the tools and the insights of neuropsychology with you and the world, to try to create better understanding for what people who live with brain health issues are going through. It is my sincere belief that these three things will reduce the unnecessary suffering that comes along all too often with living with a brain health challenge. There is so little high quality information that gets shared and much too little validation of the emotional side of brain health issues. We get so medical, we focus so much on the physical stuff that it's really important that we also recognize the emotional and the psychological journey that often goes along with brain health issues. Tonight our talk is on brain stem cavernous angiomas and this was directly inspired by a Facebook group called STEMIES. How did I get connected with the wonderful STEMIES? Well, it's all through their wonderful leader named Gary. I understand there's also another woman who is a pharmacist who's on there and I so appreciate her, but my contact so far has been with Mr. Gary. We have spoken on the phone and we decided that it would be very helpful for not only that group to learn from me as a neuropsychologist, but really for me to learn from them about this relatively uncommon condition. In my years of practicing, I have never had a patient who has had a brainstem cavernous angioma, and so I had a lot to learn. And so I was very happy to accept his invitation for me to come on their Facebook page and to do a lecture. Last week, I talked to all of you about cavernous angiomas in general, but tonight we're gonna focus on what happens when it is specifically in the brainstem. It does change things. There is nothing that I love more than collaborating with people about more and better education and brain health issues, so I am really thrilled to be with you all tonight and welcome any of you that are new to us here. I have a very strong belief that the way people will have their very best outcome and recovery is when the expertise of a medical doctor and the expertise of the person living through it can come together and in a complementary way share their expertise to further understanding, assessments, treatment recommendations. So I strive very hard to be a good listener as a doctor and to really respect the uh, experiences that my patients teach me about. So by all means, as I am going through this lecture tonight, if you think that I was a little off on what I said, it's not about me being right, I just want to get it right, so that way I can help people to the best degree possible. So what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna learn about brain stem in particular. We're gonna have a brief review on cavernous angioma just to get everyone up to speed if you didn't see me last week. Then of course I wanna talk about brain stem CA. Hey Gary, uh, specifically. And I put a little poll up on the STEMI's Facebook page about a week ago and ask them about topics they would like to hear about and reducing the risk of a bleed and managing the anxiety of the wait and watch approach is something that stood out to me that maybe as a psychologist I could give some insight into. So we're gonna start off by talking about the brainstem. The brainstem is about the size of an adult thumb. And actually it's funny when I was practicing of how I could best communicate this information, uh, it actually not only is about the size, but it's also kind of the shape. And so what we're gonna talk about is what this structure does, what are the substructures within it, and go through the three different main areas and talk about their functions and what happens when they're not working very well. The brain stem is a intermediate area between the spinal cord and the brain. It can actually be thought of as an extension of the spinal cord going right into the brain. All the information from the body uh, going into the cerebral hemispheres here and the cerebellum in the back and vice versa is relayed through the brainstem. So it's got bottom up functions going from the peripheral nervous system all the way up to the brain, but also top down functions where things coming from the brain, our thoughts, our desires, our interests actually gets relayed down through the peripheral nervous system into the body. It plays a very important role in some basic bodily functions. Cardiac, respiratory, consciousness, and the sleep-wake cycle are the four main areas that when we think of brainstem. 
in the brain stem contains almost all of the cranial nerves except number one and two. So there's 12 cranial nerves and three through 12 basically emanate or come directly through the brain stem. Uh, the cranial nerve number one is the optic nerve, so that doesn't run anywhere through the brain stem, and also the olfactory nerve. All of the other ones, which cranial nerves basically bring information from the sense organs, so touch, um, hearing, vision, um, into the brain, and they can also do things like control certain muscles, specifically for um, the eye muscles. We know that they connect certain internal organs and glands, hearts and lungs, all the way up to the relay and reflex centers in the brain. Um, well, Tony had a question about STEMI's name, is that patronizing? Well, I didn't name them. They actually named themselves. Um, and I think uh, the idea is to kind of um, take some kind of ownership or kind of have a little bit of a lighthearted approach to this very serious thing. Gary, you can chime in on that if you, if you think so. Um, so within this uh, adult thumb that we're gonna use as our metaphor for um, the brainstem, there is a little top part here that is the midbrain. The pons is kind of right there and that actually sticks out a little bit. It's like a little nub. And then underneath that is the medulla oblongata. So I wanna look at these structures in depth. When I put my poll up on STEMIs, I ask folks if they knew where in the brainstem they had their issue. And um, most people did, which made me very happy because when we say brainstem, it's easy to think, oh, that's, that's it. It's just one structure. No, it's actually made up of three, but really there's a fourth one because there's a secondary thing in the pons. But we have the midbrain on top. So 14 of my people who's taking me my, um, took my poll, said that's where theirs was, 14 in the midbrain. 81 people said in the pons and 11 said in the medulla oblongata. So I wanna just go through these a little bit in some detail because I want those of you, this is such a specific thing we're talking about tonight. I wanted to make sure everybody felt like they learned a little something about their unique situation. So the midbrain. This is the part of the brain that we think is responsible for wakefulness and the regulation of homeostasis. And that is very important concept because later when we start talking about stress management, I'm gonna come back to that. So keep that in mind. So what is homeostasis? It's the body's ability to maintain a stable and relatively constant internal environment. This is stuff like your temperature, the concentration of glucose in your cells and in your brain cells, you know, pH balance, electrolytes. It's just when everything is kind of just right. And this is what the brain wants. This is what the body wants. This is really what the person, the spirit wants too. The midbrain is definitely associated with vision, hearing, motor control, sleep wake, like I said, the level of alertness that we have and temperature regulation. So after the midbrain, remember we get down to the pons. So pons is the Latin word for bridge and it kind of makes sense because that's that little uh, nubby part right there. It contains the nuclei, um, which are just clusters of neurons that relay signals from the forebrain back to the cerebellum. So the forebrain, a lot of lingo tonight, is actually almost all the whole brain except, except the brainstem. It's basically the both cerebral hemispheres and a lot of the structures that are kind of deep within it, like the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pineal gland, which is where a lot of our, it's called like the master hormone maker, and the limbic system, which is the emotional center. And the reason I wanna bring that up is because so often we think about brain structures being contained in these islands, and you know, I have a brain stem issue. But the truth is so much of the brain is interconnected that I think it's very important to understand where in the brain, of course, your unique brain injury is, but what other areas is it connected to? Because many times we get indirect effects in the brain, meaning your frontal lobes may be perfectly intact, but if you have a problem with your cerebellum, cerebellar stroke or a degenerative issue in your cerebellum because there's these big circuits white matter tracks think of them like kind of these long rubber bands that connect two tarts two different parts of the brain you're also going to get some trouble with your frontal lobes because it's all interconnected so within the brain stem 
I think, you know, sometimes we um, dumb it down in conversation and we just think it's all cranial nerves or, you know, it's all vision or it's all how your tongue moves. Well, guess what? We know there's also interconnections with other much more uh, areas of the brain that have a lot more real estate. So it's very hard to pin things down in the brain. So the clusters of cells in the ponds have a lot to do with sleeping, respiration, breathing, swallowing, controlling our bladder, hearing, our sense of taste, our ability to move our eyes, our facial sensations, facial numbness, so sense, you know, um, expressions in the face, and our posture. Um, it passes sensory information. So like I said, of course, we have touch, we have our vision, we have our hearing, we have our taste, everything except smell goes through the ponds up to the thalamus. The thalamus is the main relay station in the brain. And again, it takes in all senses except smell. That's why smell is such a visceral, almost primal sense, especially when it comes to trauma or post-traumatic stress, because there's no processing that happens. It goes directly from the nose into the olfactory bulb, and it's like pure emotion. That's why so many times, you know, how many of us hate the smell of a dentist office because you walk in and it's like, oh, or a smell of the hospital? Well, especially if you've had a stroke or you've had a bleed, the brain wants you to live, right? And whenever it feels that there's a threat in the environment, it wants to take in all the information and encode it as clues to the danger. So that way in the future, you can try to avoid that. So whatever was happening in the environment when you had your brain health issue, stroke, aneurysm, a lot of times that gets really encoded and you try to avoid those things. Those things trigger a very big stress response in you. So I was talking to someone the other day and they said they had a brain bleed when they were at a barbecue and um, they were eating hot dogs. And he said, I never thought about it, but ever since then, when I smell a hot dog, I get really, really upset and I feel like I just wanna leave. It's because it's the brain does a lot of pairing with trauma. It's always trying to protect us, so it wants to get things all close together. Um, the pons is actually the part of the brain where we think that dreaming happens. Um, it is the sleep paralysis center of the, the brain, so I was curious if maybe any of you ever have that feeling where your mind is kind of awake but your body is still asleep and it's kind of like you're trapped between the worlds of wakefulness and sleeping. It also has a big role in hearing, again, taste, equilibrium, sensations like touch and pain, um, eye movements, facial expression, chewing, swallowing, urinating, and the secretion of saliva and tears. Um, so that's very important as we start to think of what are some of these um, symptoms that are happening and one of the things that I would struggle with is how do we know when we are maybe having a bleed? Because when we start to talk about CA, as many of you experts who live with this know, there's a big risk for having very chronic low level bleeding often. And what we're looking for is these bigger bleeds. But so many of those symptoms um, can be all over the place, um, like headaches, for example. Well, how many of us without CA often have a headache, right? So that's part of the struggle, I would imagine, is how do you not get so hypervigilant about your body and your possible symptoms that you can live a life? Because if you're so focused on feeling like I need to know what's happening in this you know, certain part of my body. So I like to talk about what is happening in that part of the brain so people can pay attention better but also narrow in their focus so it doesn't just feel like any physical sensation could be a bleed. I hope that makes sense. So within the pons is something called the recticular formation. So this is made up of more than 100 very small networks of brain cells. And again, this has a lot to do with sleep, motor control, pain control. A lot of these functions in the brain stem kind of overlap and a lot of them have to do with these regulatory functions. When people get damage to both sides of their recticular formation. Almost everything in the brain is a duplicate on the left and right side. When people get the damage on both sides, um, this is when people have death or coma as it relates to uh, a brain injury. So that's very important to know because I think a lot of people are so fearful with a brainstem issue that death is a likely outcome when really it's pretty unusual that something in the brain happens in both sides, right? This is uh, also related to locked-in syndrome. So um, 
The other thing the recticular formation does, and I think this is very important for those of you that have PONS issues, is it's one of the key systems in the brain that filters out incoming information to discriminate against what's relevant and I can kind of hit the snooze button on and what should I focus on, what should I pay attention to. And this is so important, I think, because people with brain injuries of all kinds, but especially PONS issues, can get very, very overwhelmed either by visual information, auditory information, or sens sensory information. And this is because there's so much coming at us at all times, not only what's happening in our body and those sensations, so that would be like internal information, but also externally, people wanting our attention in the environment, um, the way the sunlight hits us in the environment sounds. And when your brain is healthy and your brain is working very, very well, we have these amazing internal breaks that we can pump and we can say, you know what, I'm in a lecture now, I'm just gonna focus on her uh, and I'm not gonna pay attention to what's happening outside of the uh, window here. But when you can't do that and you're pulled in all these directions, it must feel so exhausting. It must feel like it's hard to get things done and it must just feel like you're kind of pinging all over the place all the time. But you know what, that's also how anxiety feels. And so when you then get that feeling and if you don't understand it and it gets you anxious, that's where I think that neuropsychology can help you because there are things, and we're gonna talk about some of them tonight, that we can do to start to walk the nervous system down a little bit because then once you're in that hyper state, I love all these um, thumbs up you guys are giving me and, and the yeses, that just makes me feel so great to make you feel understood because um, I know a lot of you have that experience with your doctor where you just don't feel like they get it. So. It's my privilege to be able to read about it and understand it and explain it in a way that makes sense to you. So that, that just makes my day. Um, what I get really worried about with people being overwhelmed with senses is that they then start to isolate and to avoid. And that leads to a whole host of other problems. A lot of people try to dampen down the senses by doing things like wearing sunglasses. I remember Gary, we, we were emailing and you told me that you wear sunglasses sometimes to like keep things, you know, a little bit darker. Um, they, people often have escape areas. They avoid things like bigger parties, you know, traveling with um, earplugs is a very good idea, especially if there's little kids in your environment, like piercing, loud screams, headphones, right? Exactly, Joe. Headphones, um, even noise canceling headphones can be really, really helpful when people are at work. I've had to write... Um, I've had to write uh, workplace accommodations for people to work in cubicles by themselves after uh, damage to the thalamus and the brainstem because they literally can't concentrate because I think that word flooding makes a lot of sense to me. It's just like, it's not possible to prioritize what you're supposed to pay attention to. So then if we go down in the brainstem, we get, stem, we get to the medulla oblongata. How cool is that word? Um, this again contains cardiac, respiratory centers. This is our vomiting center. Uh, fun fact with us today. Um, I was reading an article about the medulla to prepare for you all tonight and there's some thought, it's not 100% proven, but this is the hiccup center. And I remember two people on STEMIs said to me that their very first sign when they know they're getting a bleed is they get hiccups. And I was like, aha, I think I, I understand that a little bit more now. Um, so that's basically the brainstem, okay? All those three parts and then the reticular formation within the pond. So let's just briefly talk about CA, cavernous angioma, um, and uh, get into that a little bit. So remember I said to you before, it goes by many different names. Some people call it a cavernous malformation, so they call it a CM, a cavernoma, a cavernous hemangioma. Uh, CA, berry brain. The latest one I heard about was popcorn brain because when you look at an MRI, this cluster of these little berries there. It is characterized as um, these groups of leaky blood vessels that does not contain brain, right? So this isn't a brain matter malformation. These are some very thin dilated capillaries um, that over time tend to leak blood, which has a relatively high iron content in it. And when we break down iron, it becomes this other thing called hemosiderin. And the hemosiderin can become kind of caustic, is the word we like to call it in the brain, and lead to something called vasospasm. And this is basically when the arteries, so imagine there's kind of a thin artery here, 
Um, over time, it can just get a little bit tight in the middle, so not as much blood can get through. And of course, blood carries the oxygen and the glucose that our brain cells really need. And so over time, we can actually get a cutting off of the blood in the middle and the pressure could build up and then we can get a hemorrhage. Um, but when you start to look at the number of people who actually have hemorrhages from a CA, um, it's relatively small. I'm sure it doesn't feel that way when you have one, but it's less than one to about four to five percent um, in general central nervous system areas. Um, it occurs in about 0.4 percent of the population and about 20 percent of these people have multiple lesions. My understanding is there can be acute effects from when a big bleed happens, subacute as you're building up to a bleed or getting rid of one, and chronic issues depending on how big it is and if it has something called mass effect, which is where just through taking up more space, it actually pushes against other parts of your brain. Last week I talked about how in 2017, it seems to me there was major progress made when the Angioma Alliance of the US, which sounds like the coolest group of people ever, advocated on behalf of folks to get some clinical guidelines. And we finally came out with the uh, guidelines for the clinical management of cerebral cavernous malformations, consensus recommendations, which is basically a comprehensive set of clinical guidelines for diagnosing, monitoring, and treatment along with the manifestations. So transitioning now into brainstem uh, CA specifically, this is about 20% of folks who have CA. And of course the treatment is challenging because of the location. Um, for some people, this is detected in an incidental way, which means they had a fall or there was some other reason they got a brain scan and they happened to find it or there were clinical symptoms and people got into a scanner many times, months and months, years later, and they were finally diagnosed. Part of the problem can be that unless you're going and looking for it, sometimes the MRI isn't low enough to actually visualize the brain scan stem, so the scanner actually doesn't go down that far. Um, people can have it. This was something you all helped me learn. It can be in a substructure of the brainstem. It can also go from the brainstem if it's big enough and go into other structures. So I think it was two women on STEMIs told me they have it in the pons, but it also extends into the thalamus. Um, these hemorrhages, of course, um, are concerning because of the tight, tight space that's in there within the brainstem. And within that tight, tight space, there's all sorts of very delicate, tender crossings and interconnections in these nuclei, which are those kind of groupings of uh, brain cells. And they're so, so, so close to each other. And they're in such a tight spot that the idea is there's very little room for swelling or bleeding. And so we get very concerned about bleeds in this area. We get very concerned about doing surgery because there's just so little room before you get into some very dangerous swelling. Um, one of the big question that I was asked is how do we manage symptoms of a bleed? Meaning how can we prevent them from happening or what can we do once we know they're happening to get rid of the blood? And so what I tried to do was to get in touch with um, the lead of that um, 2019 no, 2018 conference in Switzerland that I told you all about last week, who is, happens to be a very nice guy. This is where they gathered experts from all around the world and all they really did was focus on surgery in the brainstem. And they focused, I know one morning, the whole focus was on CA. And so I couldn't really find any scientific papers about it. So I asked him and interestingly, he told me that he thinks, the field thinks, that physiological stress, physical activities, do not lead to the bleedings. That they had plenty of patients who did marathons, who were long distance runners, who lifted weights, and they didn't ever see that there was a clinical correlation there. He said there's no scientific proof of a way to avoid a bleed beyond managing high blood pressure that the latest thing was to focus on uh, a beta blocker, propanolol, and that that might be a way to actually reduce the amount of um, intracranial pressure. But his theory was that we had a lot more work to do in terms of psychological stress being a trigger. And I thought that was really interesting and I kind of posed that to the group. Um, 
And so for some people, they feel like that's true. And for other people, they feel like that's not true. But I certainly think that stress management is a huge thing that we have to talk about tonight because whether or not it's something that would prevent you from having a bleed or it's just something that would help you live a higher quality of life. And how do you do that knowing that you have this issue and you're just told watch and wait and you don't really know what's going to happen? I think that it's a huge reason to really value stress management, working really hard to keep your life relatively stress-free. And as so many of you have pointed out, just having this condition is stressful. So then you, you know, put life on top of that and it's kind of a whole new thing. So one of the things they talked about in this conference is how often should people get a MRI scan when they're not symptomatic? And um, so many people on STEMIs had a reaction to that, um, which I didn't understand, of course, not being someone who um, I don't live with it, but how unbelievably stressful it is to wait for the results of the MRI. So what these researchers said is they actually saw zero value in getting an annual brain scan if you're not symptomatic, that it's a waste of resources, it causes people too much anxiety, and that their clinical recommendation was to not have a regular yearly schedule of getting scanned, but to really go by people's symptoms. So I wanted to ask you all that tonight is, do you think you would prefer to hear once a year that everything was okay or not if they found something, or do you agree with them that going by symptoms is something that would work better for you in terms of your overall stress level? So even though he told me he doesn't think there's physiological things that people do that cause a bleed, I guess there's a little part of me that doesn't 100% buy that because we know that intracranial pressure on leaky capillaries and vessels is, is going to make things leak more and have more of a bleed. So I tried to do research on when you look at um, other recommendations for reducing hemorrhagic stroke, what do they tell those people? Because that's a big thing I think in brain science is that um, we need to cross pollinate. And so for example, when I tried to look in the scientific research, and see what the recommendations are or what the numbers are for levels of anxiety in people that have CA, I could not find one single solitary paper. Uh, I thought maybe there would even be something in there uniquely about brainstem, but no. So of course, there's a whole world of stress management literature and in a few minutes, that's exactly what we're gonna talk about. So looking in the world of reducing the risk of a brain bleed, again, they do talk about early blood pressure control, that that's key making sure that your blood isn't too thin or too thick. So that way when it is moving throughout these thin capillaries in the CA, that basically if it's too thick, you're gonna potentially get a clot and get into trouble. Or if it's too thin, you're gonna be much more likely to bleed out. So knowing, they, they call this your coagulability, the thickness or thinness of your blood, I think is an important thing. Keeping your blood sugar level steady, that has so much to do with brain fuel so the main fuel is oxygen and glucose so it makes sense you want to make sure you're really good on deep breathing and making sure your blood sugar levels are pretty steady not smoking is clearly a recommendation um, but also things like staying hydrated hydration is one of those things that gets older undersold because i think it's so common sense and it's also like free it's water so sometimes we don't pay enough attention to that recommendation but you know the body is like 85 percent water and that's what gives buoyancy to all of our cells including our brain cell and water is just key to keeping everything in the body and the brain working well and so really prioritizing your hydration is key but from that researcher's idea that he didn't think physiological stress caused that it made me think through exercise and exercise is the most evidence-based has the most scientific support behind it for improving brain health and managing stress so i think working with your brain health care provider in real life you need to talk to them about safe exercises that you enjoy that you can consistently do as a way to support your brain health um, generally speaking because you always have to remember whether it's a stroke uh, AVM, a brain tumor, a CA, that is a focal injury. The rest of your brain is good and healthy and you have to, yes, focus on that CA, but let's also do all the brain health recommendations to make the rest of your brain great so that way you can compensate. So much of neuroplasticity is moving tasks around in the brain, different parts of the brain taking up what that part of the brain used to do. 
and we need to make sure that the soil, so to speak, of the brain is fertile and organic and healthy enough to pick up all those new seeds that we're trying to drop with the neuroplasticity. Um, what you eat really matters. So we really support something called the mind diet, M-A-I-N, M-A, M-A, oh my God, I'm tired, M-I-N-D. Mediterranean Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. And we actually have a nice handout that we can put in the comments of this lecture so you all can learn more about it. But basically it is a uh, anti-inflammatory diet that's not too strict, it's, it's realistic, you can do it, but the goal is to keep your blood vessels nice and healthy and stable so that way you can get optimal oxygenation and blood flow to the brain. Um, I definitely wanted to touch on surgery a little bit in this lecture, but I really can't go down that rabbit hole too much because, oh my gosh, there's a lot of literature on that and it's very complex and in depth. But I did just wanna talk a little bit about gamma knife radio surgery because I had been reading articles that it's kind of becoming the first line treatment for most people with brainstem CA. And when I said that on STEMIs, they were like, no, we, we, we don't, we're, not, we're told that's not good for us. So I went back and looked at the literature and basically what they're saying is that um, yes, the rehemorrhage rates after gamma versus regular surgery is not ideal. People are still having more bleeds initially, but that over time they actually get less and less bleeds. And that a big study came out last year that concluded that gamma knife radio surgery was a safe and effective treatment for symptomatic, so you've had a bleed, low volume brainstem CAs when a low marginal dose is used. So what that means is not over blasting the brain with the radio surgery. And when they talk about low volume uh, brainstem CAs, I think what they're saying is that they have to be relatively small and it really depends on the placement within the brainstem. So again, we need more research. You need to talk to your specific doctor about it. But I do think it's important to know that there is potentially a game changer out there that could become available um, clinically. So remember I went back to my Swiss doctor and he said, I think psychological stress could be a big factor. So not only is having this, I think an inherently stressful thing, but remember that word homeostasis that I said before? So that is a function of the brainstem, right? Well, listen to this definition of stress. Okay, so in one research report I read, it said stress is defined as a situation where your homeostasis is threatened or the organism perceives a situation as threatening. So if we take that definition as correct, that means that a brainstem CA is pretty much the definition of a stressful event because it is literally threatening your homeostasis. So like I said, you got that, and then we've got life piled on top of it here. So stress management feels like as a psychologist, maybe the most helpful thing besides information that we can talk about here. And I have some other lectures on this. Um, one of them might be positive versus negative coping. But just to go through it briefly in our time together tonight, I wanna briefly talk about the stress response system in the body and the brain, because it's really important. So it's located both in the brain and in the peripheral nervous system in the body. In the brain, there's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which has a lot to do with how we respond to stress. And in our body, we have the adrenal glands. They're these two little like kidney beans that sit on top of our kidneys. And they are activated whenever we kind of cross a threshold for a threat or a stressful event. And how we interpret that is does this event does it, is it going to give me something that I can't handle? Do, does it outweigh my resources to cope with it, right? So if you get a notice from your bank that you bounced a check and it is a $29 bank fee and you've got $50 in the bank, okay, it stinks, but hey, I've got the money. If you get a notice that the IRS miscalculated your taxes and you owe $17,000 and you have $50 in the bank, well, that's gonna be a much different situation, right? So depending on the stressor, your brain does these very quick evaluative responses to um, decide, do I have the resources to, to cope with this? Our nervous system, our stress response system is awesome. It is our best friend in a short-term stressor. So we're walking, we're out in the woods, the tiger comes, our nervous system goes haywire, we get a big dump of stress hormones like cortisol, means our muscles can act really quick, our respiration goes crazy, our heart pounds harder, we're able to fight, 
flight or freeze, right? But what happens when stress is continuous, when stress never goes down? The nervous system was designed to get stressed out and then go back to homeostasis. The problem is those of us who stay up here constantly stressed out. Those stress hormones like cortisol are very, very bad for the brain. Remember I said before the metaphor of soil? Well, guess what? It's like pouring pesticides in there, okay? We all do something, this is coping, to get back to homeostasis. The difference is when we do something positive to help us or if we do something that in the long run is going to be negative. We are all coping because we are all here, but we need to talk about what's negative coping, which may feel good in the moment, but always backfires or what might not feel so great in the moment, but in the long term actually reduces our stress. And you could really break these things down into approach and avoidance. The worst thing we can do with stress is to bury our head in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist because that takes a certain amount of energy to push it down, push it down, and guess what? Just like trying to put a ball down in a bathtub, it's always gonna pop up somewhere else when you don't expect it and come up with a splash. I've heard a lot of people with C CA say, the best thing I can do is try not to think about it and to be distracted. And I respect that that helps. And I'm sure in some ways it feels like what you have to do. And I, I think it's, it's more positive in this unique situation because there is a higher threat level than if it was something like you had a car accident five years ago. But I think there is also a time and a place for really accepting and acknowledging the reality of this brainstem CA and really trying to figure out how you can live your life with it, not pretending it's not there and not making it the focus of your life. It seems to me that that's really the challenge and where you may need a professional, trusted, compassionate mental health partner is to figure out how can I do that? I don't wanna live feeling like it's right in front of me, but I also can't pretend I don't have this thing because I do. Negative coping would also be like drinking, you know, taking sleeping pills, eating our feelings. The positive side of coping is really having the final goal being acceptance. You're not wearing rose colored glasses, but you're not wearing black gloomy glasses either. You're not avoiding life because you're being so overprotective, but you're also not pretending like you don't have it and you know, going out there with a blast every day. It's definitely a balance. Everyone is confirming that, right? It's a fine balance for sure. Um, I did ask a couple people in psychology that I really respect. Um, they focus a lot on coping. You know, ha let me give you the scenario. Let me tell you about brainstem CA and what would you think? And two of them actually said the exact same thing, which is, wow, in a way, if you could think of it positively, I bet these people have or have the capacity to have a very deep gratitude for just a normal day. So many people complain of being bored or, you know, uh, you know, get into simple complaints or get caught up in drama. And when you, you know, this is what we hear from our friends who have things like cancer is you really just appreciate life and nature and being in the moment. And, and I actually heard a couple people say, wow, you know, um, I bet they really feel like they're living every day. And I thought, wow, that's a really adaptive way to look at it. That's not a view you're gonna be able to hold on to every single day. The, the goal of positive coping is not, it's not realistic to think you can always react perfectly, but if you can try to train yourself, okay, wow, I feel like I'm veering down a little bit of a negative hole and I'm, I am uh, isolating and I'm, I'm, I'm getting caught up in stupid stuff, you know, just trying to correct yourself a little bit, I think is helpful. There are specific evidence-based strategies for stress management. One of the best ones is progressive muscle relaxation. This has been around since the 1920s, and it's a technique for reducing chronic muscle tension and stress in the body. And the idea is that muscle tension and anxiety and stress all kind of go hand in hand and they kind of feed each other. And so the idea is that for 10 seconds, you try to really uh, hold on tight to different muscle groups and then release it for 20 seconds. And you wanna do this like two to three times a day for 15 minutes at a time. And the idea is once you get into a habit, you can actually in a quick portable way without any side effects, feel what it's like to be under tension and to have anxiety and be stressed or feel what it's like to be calm and relaxed. That is, 
Um, basically the heart and soul of a lot of different stress management techniques, whether it's guided visualization, uh, hypnosis, massage. Um, I think that for a lot of people really focusing on relaxing the body um, and helping the nervous system come down from that high level of fight or flight or hypervigilance is the best thing that you can really do for yourself. It's very hard to have calm thoughts if your body is just running, running, running really high. Um, so like I said, I do have some other um, talks on this on this uh, Facebook page. So if you wanna go in there and see what we've talked about in terms of coping before, I would um, appreciate it. Yeah, there's great apps like Ohm. Somebody just told me today they like the Calm app. You really just have to make it a priority that you are going to make stress management a goal of your everyday life. It's That's maybe the most important thing that I can tell you from my um, looking at the literature. So, um, before we go today, I want to tell you three things. First thing is thank you all so much for your attention and being here with me tonight. I know you all know so much more than I do about this. I'm really a student in your classroom and I so appreciate all the comments and look forward to hearing from any of you. Yeah, Headspace, Joe, totally. Headspace is another great one. We should have Headspace as a sponsor, Joe, right? Um, I wanted to tell you two other things besides my, my thank you and my gratitude is that um, we have come out with the stroke recovery guide that may be useful to some of you because you're welcome, Catherine, um, because some of you who've had bleeds, that's considered a hemorrhagic stroke. And so I was prompted to write the stroke recovery guide after reading research that 90 to 95 percent of people in the uh, stroke world have significant unmet needs mostly in the realm of high quality education and psychological healing and i just couldn't go on any longer without offering something to the community that i think really will make a difference um, it is at our website which is www.icfyb.com backslash guide it is $27 for a hard copy sent to your house and $17 for an electronic copy, which we have available really for our international folks because postage is just so much. We worked really hard to make it as good as it can be. It's 116 pages of um, education, coping skills, um, advocacy scripts. It's interactive because you have to make learning personalized if it is going to really make a difference and we worked hard to get a sponsor to get the price down as low as it could possibly be. Um, in the next few weeks, two amazing things are happening. I am actually going on vacation. The second amazing thing is we're going to do something called summer school. So remember before I said that it's very critical after a brain injury that you prioritize the health of the rest of your brain. Um, the, the nine lectures that I'm going to be offering are different than what I do here, although they're kind of the same. So they're longer, they're much more in depth, they're a combination of me talking and my PowerPoint slides. They're almost always about an hour. What we're going to do is charge $5 each for folks to watch these. And the idea is that this is money that is going to go to figuring out the next step of I Care For Your Brain. We have to decide what we're going to try to do in terms of public efforts and public education. I have to kind of figure out if I am going to stay doing as much one-on-one -on -one clinical work in my practice or if I'm going to be able to refocus some of my efforts and give more time here to the online community. But the truth is, is, you know, I have a family to support and I have to figure out how I can make my living. So we're again, trying to price things because it's very important to us that they're affordable and accessible. And I know you're used to, to getting all this great information free from me on here. And I love that, but there are some times where the production costs of what I do are going to make it so we have to charge a little bit of money. I hope you all can understand that. So um, Carrie, my right hand gal here with I Care For Your Brain, she's gonna be posting some stuff while I'm away. It's nine lectures, really focused on the principles of brain health all the way from what you do with your cardiac system to stress management, sleep, medications, um, your mood, uh, your social health, everything that I could possibly think of that would help a person's brain are in this lecture series. I think you'll really like it. I worked really hard on it. I care so much about all of you out there listening. You guys are just amazing. I'm so impressed with people in the brain health community because I think the truth is when you didn't get answers from your doctor or the medical system, you said, you know what? We're gonna find these answers ourselves and we're gonna share them amongst us. 
to reduce suffering, to get the word out there, to have not people reinvent the wheel. And I just respect that so much. And in that way, we're so, so, so alike. That's why I have so much hope for our community here because I know my intentions and I feel like I know yours. And I just don't think we can go wrong with the two of us working together, a doctor and people who are affected by these brain health challenges. I really think the sky's the limit. So we got to put our head together and figure out how we can get this information out to more people. So if you like this lecture, if you like what we're doing here, please share it. Um, goes the, the most distance when you put it into um, Facebook groups. And we just want people to know this information so they don't struggle more than they have to with uh, what's going on with them. So thank you guys so much. I hope you have a great night and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.